Next up, we have a talk from Roseanne from AI Labs. She's going to be talking about an intriguing failure of convolutional neural nets. Roseanne. Hi. Hello, everyone. My name is Roseanne, and uh, I'm from AI Labs. Very thrilled to be here, and it's so heartening to see such a great turnout for this event, thanks to our amazing organizers. So um, you just heard from Yu Yan about recommenda recommendation system and ranking algorithm used in Uber Eats, which is a great example of how machine learning and data science are just making Uber be more efficient. And I'd like to switch the context a little bit now to the general research being done in Uber in the area of machine learning and AI, for specifically at AI Labs. And for those who don't know about AI Labs, we are a unit situated in Uber, consists of a bunch of researchers trying to advance the state of AI to the next level. And uh, in the research world, what you do is basically you take a concept and trying to understand them, asking questions about, say, how they work, why they work, where they do work and do not work. And then you assemble the findings maybe in a paper and hopefully people will be interested to read them. Uh, so today I'm gonna to talk about such a finding in neural networks. So if you think about AI, people have been working in the area of AI for like five, six decades. And arguably only the recent decade we've seen a huge explosion of progresses and all having to do with this concept deep learning or the fact that neural networks start working. Now we have machine learning models beating human performances in tasks like recognizing a dog's breed, drawing bounding boxes around tiny, tiny objects, and playing games, not just this Atari game, but AlphaGo playing Go game, and painting photorealistic pictures like this. If you think that there's one thing in common in all these success stories, is the one special type of neural network being used here called convolutional neural networks or confidence. In fact, it's been so successful and so well known that now that every time you have a task where pixels are concerned, people immediately think about using confidence as a solution. If you take one of those examples, um, generative models where confidence are used to paint images like this and think about how hard this task is, so a confidence, there's, there's a confidence out there being trained to paint this very, very amazing pictures from almost nothing, just a, a series of random numbers. Somehow they're able to find a mapping there from these random numbers to these great pictures. So if you acknowledge that, and then take the same confidence, same thing, you can make them big, train them well, and ask them to not paint anything big, but just paint one pixel. And from a location of that pixel, that is given, you wouldn't think this is too hard, right? So no colors, no trying to figure out the shades of colors of the hair, the shape of the face, of human intricacies of everything, just one pixel, black and white, just binary. And no unsupervised learning, this hard difficulty of training GANs and uh, trying to find a mapping in the high level latents, no, I'm giving you the exact location of that pixel. And there's supervision at every step of the way. If I move the location, I move the pixel, there's a loss coming from there. So everything's supervised. This task we define as coordinate transform is exactly what it is. It's a transform between two coordinate systems, the Cartesian space and the pixel space. And the breaking story of today is that actually calmness are really, really bad at this. But do you really believe it? So you guys are working data and research and or aspire to work in data. Maybe that's why you come here. So if you are like me, you would like to see some experimental results suggesting that it's hard or easy or something. So let's just try training a bunch of models. Hook up TensorFlow, build a bunch of models and train them hard enough and see how they work. To train models, you need data. So for this problem, it's really easy. You create a bunch of images that are just black and then each having one pixel on. And the pixel can be anywhere in the space. And to evaluate machine learning models, you need a train test and test set. So you just split all the, all the images to make sure that at any time an image is either in train or test. So you can split them randomly in a uniform way. That's what we call uniform split. Or you can do it, uh, give it a harder job, hold out one of its quadrants, one of its four quadrants as test set. So we test everything on these two kinds of splits. 
And they just train a bunch of models. You have data, you have TensorFlow, code, everything, just train, right? And for every model we plot is um, performance on this chart, train accuracy versus test accuracy. And the place where the smiley face is indicates the best performance you can get, which is perfect training, perfect testing. That's great. And for such a simple test, you would assume confidence can just easily solve it, right? But we train it hard enough. I trained so many models, hundreds of them. And uh, I consider myself an expert in training models. But then I was disheartened assuming this. So none of the model actually reaches a smiley face. And they're actually really bad if you think about it. Some of them ne never really worked. And some of them do work, but they're largely overfitting, which means training is better than testing. That's the thing that we don't want to see. And this is under the uniform split, which is easy. Uniform split, you're randomly splitting each pixel into train and test. So almost for every test pixel, you have surrounding training pixels telling them the, the right supervision uh, signal. So even that is bad. If you switch to that quadrant split, the situation is just dire. None of the model really performs. So we really want to know what's happening here. And as researchers, what you, how you know is you take a model and then just look deep into it, see what's happening there. So neural network is just a bunch of weights, right? And a bunch of outputs. Let's just see what's happening. So we take the best model here, train under a uniform split, having uh, 86 test accuracy, which is not very good. So we want to see what it's really doing. So this network was trained to paint pixels from location. And we can just feed the model different examples and see how they respond. So if I feed the model an example, a training example, containing one pixel, uh, contain the location of that pixel and see what it paints. So this model gives me this. The last layer is a softmax layer, which produces a probability distribution across all the spatial locations. So this is a train pixel. So when, when it was being trained, it was, taught, it was told to place every probability at this right location, uh, the target location. But still, after many hours of training, it's still, it's a little bit wrong. Like, like the answer is right. Now, the maximum probability is placed at the right position, but some probability leaks outside the target pixel, which is just not perfect. And when you move one pixel over and run into a test pixel, you see that more pixel, more probabilities leak outside of the target pixel. And also they form this weird diagonal artifact, uh, which is known as artifacts of deconvolution. But so that's just not perfect. And if you just keep moving and they will run into sometimes train pixels, test pixels, you'll see that it's never perfect. It's always making something wrong, even though the end result might be perfect. So accuracy is actually misleading because as long as you put the maximum probability there, you may you get the pixel right, but you're never perfect. So that's a problem of this model. So commoners are really don't really know how to paint one pixel, even though they are assumed to paint pictures and everything. That's weird. But people may argue, maybe this is hard because convolution are not really uh, used to deal with pixels being the output. They're, they're good at taking pixels in and then summarizing information like how they did with uh, recognizing the dog and drawing bounding boxes. So we tried this direction as well, and we call it uh, coordinate regression. And train many landlords, take the best one. So. Now, for each pixel they see, they have to tell me where it is. And this is the, the exact location they have to tell me. And the best network still struggles visibly to predict the training set. And on the test set, it just barely performs at all. So I hope you are convinced that this direction is also hard. So we've proved that both directions of this coordinate transform problem is really hard for calmness to do. But you may wonder, why do we really care about such a problem? Well. The fact is, um, this isn't where we started, but rather the end of a long investigation of why things don't work. We actually started way up there, trying to train some generative models for moving objects, which is a moderate task to, to do in research. And we found it hard, so we tried to simplify it every step of the way, and still finding that each one of them harder than expected. And then we reached here, catching the culprit of the whole problem. So this simple task is actually underlines all other tasks and solving it they bring benefits to a whole series of tasks. So in research, uh, it's great enough that you find a problem, you can write about it, and if people believe it, it's great. But it's even greater if you have a solution. And I have today uh, in front of you with just that, quote Convolution works this way. 
is a bunch of filters applied to the input to generate the output without knowing where they are because the weights are shared and just moves around the space. But maybe sometimes it's important to know where they are just as in the coordinate transform case, we would naturally know the coordinates. So the Quarkonf solution is a simple modification of convolution by adding two channels to the input, which tells the, con the filter the I location and J location in Cartesian space. So it would be like four, six, something like that. So in this way, when each filter is applied to the input, it knows not only the local information, but also globally, whether you're at the top corner of the image or lower corner of the image. Simple modification. Because it's so simple, it keeps all the great things about convolution, like having a few parameters, really faster train on GPUs, and it will learn to be flexible about translation equivariance if, you, if it learns all the ways to be, uh, from the channel to be, from the digital channels to be zero, it will be translation equivariant, exactly the same as convolution, or it can learn to be translation dependent, depends on your task. And it's a dropping replacement for convolution. So anytime you have a network, like in this case, AlexNet, having many convolutional layers, you can easily swap them with CordConf, all of them, some of them, or none of them, as much as you want. They train the same way, inference the same way. It's really easy. So now with a solution, the only remaining question is, do they work, right? Um, in this case, do they fix the problems I showed you before, the painting pixels or tiling pixels? And maybe do they work in a larger domain, real world problems like image classification and things? So we test that. Previously, we see the struggling in painting a pixel, really never really get it correct. Now with CordConf, every single pixel is painted correctly with all the probabilities um, located at the right place. So everything's correct. So they fixed this model, but not just this model, they fixed every single model. So before we trained 200 of them, they have a spread like this. Now every single one of them, so this is one dot, but it's 200 dots underneath that. Every single one of them have perfect training and perfect task accuracy. And I didn't tell you, but before it takes hours to train to a mediocre performance, now it takes 10 seconds to reach a perfect solution. So in this case, core count model is 30 times smaller and 500 times faster to train. The other direction, I guess you could know, is perfectly soft as well. So I hope this question, you're convinced that this question is answered with a resounding yes. And now we just tested it on more problems because it's so easy to swap out convolution with CordConf. It's really easy to test them on a range of domains. So all those domains that you've seen examples before, image classification would be the one with dog, recognize the dog breed. Um, object detection would be drawing bounding boxes around images. Uh, generating models would be painting things, painting human faces and things. And reinforcement learning would be trying to play games. So we tried on all of them. In image classification, you're not supposed to see much improvement because CNNs are actually designed for that task to be translation invariant. So it is not important to know in the image where each object is. It's just more important to know what, what it is. So indeed, we didn't see much improvement. It never hurts it, but the improvement is very slightly. In object detection, it, it is a larger part there's a larger improvement being seen because object detection, you exactly look at physical space and then draw bounding boxes in Cartesian space. So we did see a large improvement in object detection models. In generative models, it helps find better latent space and in reinforcement learning, it helps the game to be played better. So I'm gonna show you some results from say generative models. In this case, again, generative adversarial network. And in this simple task, we ask a network to paint some objects, colorful objects moving around. And if you train two networks, one with convolution, one with cord comp, train them really hard, they can kind of do the job correctly when you sample them. So both of them seem to do the job pretty well, but the difference comes in when you um, interpret the latent space. So when you interpret latent space generated by convolution, you see that there's weird artifacts tied to the canvas. When things move, they don't move smoothly at all. Some bits of the object are simply appearing and disappearing. When you interpret in court comp, you see things move around more smoothly. That means there's a more meaningful latent space being learned. If you train larger GANs on indoor bedroom scenes, you see that indoor scenes, their furniture beds are being painted, but with convolution, they just fade in and out. With court comp, you see things move around, 
That means it learns the geometric translation deformation. You can also use convolution easily to play games. So in one of the games, Miss Pac-Man, you can think it's probably useful for filters to both recognize Miss Pac-Man and then also know its location in the maze. So as expected, Horicom brings a lot of dif difference improvement in its scores. Another game may help learn faster. Another game, we didn't see much difference uh, in the scores. So we test nine games. Oops, tested nine games. And in six of them, it was better. Two of them, they performed similarly. And in one, it was worse. So in general, we think RL can make use of Quercom in a large way. So in summary, I've told you about this small problem. And somehow, both directions failed. Uh, we see a, a big failing of convolution in this problem. And I've told you the solution of QuartConf, and we've tested in all those domains and show performance in most of them. So we've write, uh, written up this uh, into a paper called Intriguing Failing of Convolutional Neural Networks and the QuartConf Solution. So these are my amazing collaborators from AI Labs, mostly from AI Labs. Alex is from Machine Learning uh, Platform, which produced uh, Michelangelo, the machine learning system that's are used across Uber. And uh, the paper is going to be uh, presented at NIPS later this year. So if you're at NIPS, come say hi to us. Or if you're around Montreal in December for some weird reason, come say hi to us. Uh, most of our AI lab is going to be there. And we've also written a blog post and filmed an eight-minute video of it. So be sure to check it out. And uh, thank you all for listening. That'll be the end of my talk. Thank you.